Hello, global students, and welcome to this first episode in our Global History and Geography Regents Review. So the whole point of these videos is to give you a solid foundation on some of the older content from our course. And the whole point of this is it's a foundation. It's not the end-all be-all of studying. You're still expected to read through the detailed notes that you took in class throughout the semester. So I'm going to hit the big topics. Um, for example, in this episode, I'm going to cover the Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, Napoleon, and the Latin American Revolutions. That's a ton of content. That's like almost three to four weeks of in-class material that I'm going to do in one presentation. So it's going to be big, it's going to be general, but you're going to get the key foundation. Here we go. So starting with the Scientific Revolution, we are going to look at... One of the basis of it, which is the whole idea of a questioning attitude. So what scientists are going to start doing is questioning the previously agreed upon ideas about science and astronomy, the stars. So what they're basically going to do is believe that the world is a rational place that is guided by these natural laws of the universe. For example, the law of gravitation would be considered a natural law. It doesn't have it doesn't have to be affected by humans to exist. It just exists. So uh, one of the key foundations of the scientific revolution is the scientific method. Having an agreed upon way of doing science is how you prove that science is correct. Moving on. So I'm going to hit upon the really, really, really important scientific revolution thinkers, and we can't do that without Copernicus. Gotta know him. He is the founder, or at least one of the founders, of the heliocentric model of the universe, which says the sun is the center of the universe. And who does that directly combat? That combats the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church said it was a geocentric model of the universe, meant the Earth is at the center and all the planets revolve around it and the sun. But the heliocentric model is saying the sun is at the center, so the Earth revolves around the sun. And that is a disagreement with the Church, and that's bad news bears. All right. Next, we have the popularizer of the heliocentric model, and that is Galileo. Also should know him quite well. And what he's going to do is really popularize this idea that the sun is at the center of our solar system, although he said universe, but we get the point. Um, and the way he's going to do that is he will develop a really powerful telescope. Um, a classic technology question they sometimes ask is how does technology impact science? And there you go. Telescope is kind of fun to do. Um, so when he starts popularizing the idea, the Catholic Church doesn't like like that, they bring him to a trial, they force him to recant or uh, take back everything he said, but regardless, really important scientific thinker. Moving on, as you can see, we're going fast. Uh, Isaac Newton, yes, that is gravitation guy. So what he does is he actually proves the heliocentric model, and the way he does that is by using mathematical calculations, and you can't disagree with math. Well, the Catholic Church will try, but you really can't disagree with math. So look at Isaac Newton as really the, the truly the father of or, uh, of the scientific revolution. He is saying the entire universe is based on natural laws. What is true on Earth can exist on other planets. Think of the law of gravitation. Uh, so Isaac Newton, another key uh, person you got to know. All right, so. A nice transition from the scientific revolution is now the Enlightenment. So if the scientific revolution questioned science, the Enlightenment of the 1700s will question government. What is the best form of government? The type of government that was really popular in the 1700s, when the Enlightenment starts forming, was a divine right absolute monarchy. Divine right meant the king said they were king because God said so. God placed them on that throne. And then absolute monarchy, you have one king who controls pretty much the entire government. There usually isn't some type of parliament to check the power of the king. So you have enlightened philosophers like John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Baron de Montesquieu, who will question, is that actually the best form of government? Okay, so to essentially said what I just said, uh, major questions they will ask besides the best form of government one is, do people actually have rights? John Locke will say they do. They have three of them. So here we go 
with some specificity. John Locke, 135% gotta know him, star, star, star. Uh, John Locke comes up on almost every single Regents exam. Uh, so the key understanding for him is he is going to say, uh, humans, although in his time period he really said it was white men specifically, um, but he's going to say people have three natural rights. Life, liberty, property. Life and liberty are fairly self-explanatory. Property can mean money, um, basically the ability to own things. It can also be land, obviously. But those are three natural rights that the government is obligated to protect. They have to. So the question is, what if your government doesn't protect your life, your freedom? Well, John Locke has an answer for you. And that answer? Revolution. So, John Locke's argument is if your government sucks, it doesn't protect your natural rights. As a citizen in that country, you're actually obligated to overthrow it. Not that you should, you need to. Um, and of course, we think of the long-term impact of John Locke. If he is saying you should overthrow your government, if it doesn't protect your natural rights, please tell me you're already thinking of the French Revolution. John Locke is one of the key inspirations of the French Revolution. All right. Thinker number two, you should know, Baron de Montesquieu. And they ask one question about Montesquieu on the Regents exam. And the answer is, or the question is, I should say, what type of government is best? A government that is broken up into three branches or three sections. Think of like the, in the United States, executive branch, legislative branch, judicial branch. The whole point of this is he's trying to prevent an absolute monarchy with one person in charge. So he believes a government needs to have the power checked by other parts of the government. Key, 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 key. All right, Rousseau. So uh, the key part of Rousseau is uh, he's one of the earlier founders of what we call a social contract, which is the agreement of regular people with the government. Regular people allow the government to govern, not the other way around. Us, normal, average Joe and Jane, tell the government, you can rule. So it's basically putting the power at the hands of the people and not the government. And that's a really key change. Um, so then we get to Voltaire. He's another relatively popular enlightened thinker, and he's the classic freedom of speech guy. Gotta know him. So um, he believes that a government can be, their power can be checked if the people have the ability to disagree with it openly and not fear arrest. Uh, he believes that there should be no such thing as a state religion. Anybody can be whatever religion they want, and they should not be persecuted for it. And he is living at a time in France where they only had one agreed upon religion, and that was the Catholic Church, uh, Catholic, um, Catholicism, sorry. So, um, other key understanding, uh, with Voltaire is he's one of our classic people who's gonna argue that you should never have the church, like whatever religion it is, and the state as one. They should be totally separated. He was definitely not a huge fan of what we call theocracies. A theocracy is a government run by the clergy, people who are actually in the church. So, Voltaire, freedom of speech guy. Alrighty, Adam Smith. So, I actually covered Adam Smith usually in the Industrial Revolution, but technically he actually was an enlightened thinker. So, uh, if you see Adam Smith's name, I want your brain to say two things. Thing number one is laissez-faire economics, which means a government should not intervene in the economy. It should take a hands-off approach. Let the economy run itself. And that is basically the foundation of capitalism. He actually doesn't use the word capitalism in his book. But if you're saying you, the government should not intervene in the economy, that's starting the idea of what we call capitalism, which is you have a private ownership. Regular people can own the means of production. They can own their own factory, their own businesses. Um, so Adam Smith is our economist of the Enlightenment. Let's say fair economics guy, and you're probably good to go. All right, and then we have Mary Wollstonecraft. So uh, usually the way she comes up on the Regents exam is something about women's rights, feminism, something of that sort. So she looks at all those enlight male Enlightenment thinkers I just talked about, and she's going to say, well, they were all sexist, and she's not wrong. Uh, so she's going to say these idea of natural rights should also apply to women. Um, so if you see Mary Wollstonecraft come up, classic female feminist thinker, um, 
argued for women's rights. Next. All right, so a uh, long-term... Oops. A uh, long-term impact of the Enlightenment. So every once in, uh, once in a while, the regents, it's really rare, uh, they'll ask about a new type of monarch that develops in Europe. Monarch meaning king, queen, emperor, empress. And they're called enlightened absolutists or enlightened despots. A despot is an, an absolute monarch. But what's changing about the enlightened absolutists, like Catherine the Great of Russia, is they're saying... God didn't put them on the throne. That's divine right absolutism. The enlightened absolutists or despots are saying they are king or queen or emperor or empress because they're actually useful to their country. They're actually benefiting the people. So it's a slight change. It doesn't come up in the exam very often. Um, so let's move on. All right. For the real long-term impact of the uh, enlightenment, you, for us, you 100% have to know the connection to the French Revolution. John Locke said, if the government doesn't protect your natural rights... For example, if you're starving to death because of lack of bread, then you need to overthrow it. And then the other major impact is the um, Latin American independence movements. So the Haitian Revolution, the Mexican Revolution, uh, other South American revolutions uh, with Simon Bolivar, Jose de San Martin, um, they're all going to use this idea of if the government doesn't protect your natural rights, you lead a revolution. So got to know that connection. All right. Next, we have the French Revolution. So again, there's so much in the French Revolution. We're going to hit the really big stuff. Full disclosure, the best favorite questions the Regents ask about the French Revolution are the causes. So if you got the causes down, you're probably in really good shape. So here we go. All right, so um, remind yourself about how there was a social class system. So this is now the social causes of the French Revolution. Uh, there are three estates. First estate, clergy. Second estate, nobility. Third estate, everybody else of the commoners. So remember the first and second estate had a huge privilege. They did not pay any taxes and overall, especially the nobility, uh, they were extremely wealthy and they're not paying any taxes. And that's going to be a problem when your country's in debt. Hmm. So naturally the third estate, which is 97% of the population and literally everybody else are jealous of the first and second estate's privileges, especially the rich middle class in the third estate, the bourgeoisie, they would love to not pay taxes and they're paying the brunt of the taxes. So we see this dichotomy, this discrepancy, this big difference between the first and second estate versus the third estate. And they are overtaxed. And especially the peasants and those urban workers, the San Kulat, same thing, um, they ne can't necessarily afford all those taxes. So this system is kind of creating a, a political perfect storm. All right. Uh, da, da. So economic causes. The key one here is the price of bread or food, but bread. So um, we are going to eventually by 1788, the year before the French Revolution happens, uh, people are going to be spending 80% of their income just on bread, just on bread, and not including anything else. So you could argue that their natural life of life is being threatened. Additionally, the French government, the reason they're taxing is because... They're in significant debt from supporting the United States uh, against the British Empire in the American Revolution. Uh, the Treaty, jeez, Treaty of Five, my bad. Uh, the uh, Ver Palace of Versailles is extremely expensive uh, to maintain. It was like 25% of the tax money in France just went to allowing the king to live. So uh, we're going to see the government's econ uh, economic system is in crisis. People are starving to death. Yeah, they're going to revolt. All right. <clears throat> So, um, again, this might get a little too detailed, but we're still going to mention this anyways. There are, for us, really three phases in the French Revolution you need to know. First and second one are key. So the National Assembly is going to be the more moderate part of the French Revolution. National Convention will be more radical. We call it the Reign of Terror for a reason. That's where we're going to start using the guillotine the most. Um, we forget about the, the directory. Forget it. And then uh, Napoleon will overthrow the French Revolution's government, and he will become dictator and eventually emperor. All right. Um, so every so often, they'll ask a question about uh, the tennis court oath. So uh, if you see a question about the tennis court oath, it's considered one of, uh, one of the beginnings of the French Revolution. That's where the third estate, when they were meeting at Versailles, um, they agreed to never leave 
Versailles until they've written a new constitution for France. And that basically is the beginning of what they call the National Assembly or the new government of France. <clears throat> so, um, the really key understanding of the National Assembly is that it is the moderate phase of the French Revolution. And the reason it's moderate is the king is still alive. So the, what the National Assembly does is they tell the King Louis XVI he is no longer the absolute monarch. He is a limited monarch or a constitutional monarch is another word for that. And that means he is basically king with not a lot of power or really any power, to be honest. Honest. Uh, so he's still there as king, but doesn't actually have real political power. Additionally, the National Assembly, which, by the way, is led by the Third Estate, surprise, surprise, uh, they are going to remove almost all of those special privileges of the First Estate and the Second Estate. Uh, so there's nothing special about being a member of clergy or a noble anymore. All right. Then, uh, some key parts of the second phase of the French Revolution is the National Convention. So the National Convention is going to be led by Robespierre, gotta know Robespierre, and Robespierre is going to basically become the dictator of the French Revolution, and that's where they're going to start using the guillotine uh, to force the revolution upon the French. So one of the key beginnings of the National Convention is they put the former king on trial, and yes, they do behead him. So King Louis XVI and eventually his wife are both beheaded by the guillotine. Um, so here we go. Just mentioned that. All right. Uh, so now we get to the really bloody part of the French Revolution. It's called the Reign of Terror for a reason. So what the French start doing is they passed a law called the Law of Suspects that basically said if someone accuses you of treason, treason means you're trying to overthrow the government, then that's enough evidence to be guilty. Yes, just the accusation of guilt is enough to be guilty. And you could be beheaded for that. So with the reign of terror is like one year in the French Revolution, and they kill at least 40,000 people, mostly by the guillotine. Then we have a not short general in the French army who is going to overthrow the whole shebang. So Napoleon uh, overthrows the French Revolution. He becomes dictator, eventually becomes emperor. And so uh, the most important idea of Napoleon is his law code. It's called Code Napoleon or the Napoleonic Code, same thing. And basically he is argue well, he makes it a law that anybody who is a citizen in any place that the French Empire controls has equality. That's huge. That's he's like exporting the Enlightenment. So in some cases, Napoleon was kind of like a, a major follower of the Enlightened ideal of more equality for more people. Um, he also argued for religious toleration. He was personally Catholic, but he said he didn't really care what religion you were as long as you didn't overthrow him. So uh, eventually, uh, Napoleon is going to get overthrown. Uh, but one of his major impacts is Napoleon starts this change of, like, in most of European history, the the kings and the nobility were the ones in charge. And Napoleon's starting to turn that around. He's now going to really start favoring the middle class, also known as the bourgeoisie. And that trend will continue into the Industrial Revolution where the bourgeoisie run the factories. And eventually the 20th century, the politicians who run countries in the 20th century, they're from the middle class or the bourgeoisie. So um, that's going to be a, a long, long-term impact, but it will eventually happen. All right. And for our last section in this review episode is going to be the Latin American revolutions. Remember, Latin America is basically the Caribbean. It is Mexico. It's um, Mexico. It's Central America. It's South America. That huge region is called Latin America. All right. As you can see right here, all of this, all of this is Latin America. Okay. So major understanding number one, the Enlightenment and the Latin American Revolution go hand in hand. So if the Enlightenment is saying there are natural rights for people, life, liberty, and property, well, what if you still have people enslaved in Haiti? That doesn't sound like having liberty. So they're going to use elements of the Enlightenment to their advantage and revolt against their European colonizer. So Latin American independence is Latin American revolts against European colonization. In Mexico, northern part of South America, southern part of South America, you get the point. 
All right, so again, um, because we're talking about people revolting against colonial control, that's obviously nationalism. So when you see Toussaint Louverture, who is the Haitian Revolution leader, you're going to think Haitian nationalist. Okay, so 100% got to know Toussaint Louverture. He comes up on almost every single regent's exam ever. Uh, so he is going to be, he was a former enslaved person. He was taught to read and write. He starts reading the books of John Locke, who is saying people have life, liberty, property. And he obviously saw the hypocrisy of the French who were enslaving him and his people. And he's going to start rallying the different groups of Haitians to now overthrow their French colonizer and enslaver. And eventually they will be successful. Um, so, by the way, the leader of France uh, for most of the revolution uh, is going to be Napoleon. And Napoleon's going to try his hardest to keep the Haitians enslaved, but the Haitians will be successful uh, because of Toussaint Louverture's military leadership. Um, one other thing to mention, it's not on the slide though, uh, Haiti does make its own constitution. And guess what the first thing they write on the constitution? All people are equal. Enslavement is abolished. So um, there, Haiti is actually really the first country in the Western Hemisphere to truly abolish slavery and create equality well before the United States did. All right. Another key uh, Latin American leader is going to be Simon Bolivar. Uh, so Bolivar is going to lead independence in really the northern portion of South America. Think of like Venezuela and Colombia. And uh, his goal is he eventually uh, wanted to make like one country out of South America. And he does for a very short period of time make a, a pretty big country in like the northern part of South America called Gran Colombia. Um, but it's short-lived and eventually collapses. Uh, but again, what is he doing is he's using the elements of the Enlightenment, life, liberty, property, and using that to inspire revolts against Spanish control over South America. All right. You know what? We're going to do one more. Congress of Vienna, because we can't talk about the Congress of Vienna without, you know, we can't talk about Napoleon without the Congress of Vienna, so I should say. So if you see the Congress of Vienna come up, here are some of the key words I want to uh, pop up into your brain. First, the Congress of Vienna is going to happen when Napoleon is kicked out of power eventually, a second time. So they want to create order and stability. They don't want another revolution. They don't want another Napoleon. So when the major leaders of the Congress of Vienna, which are like Britain, France, surprisingly, Prussia, which is Germany before Germany, uh, Austria, they are going to crush any ideas of revolution and nationalism before they become a true problem. So the way they'll do that, is any monarchy that was overthrown, <laughs> like France, uh, will be restored to power. They basically want to like turn back the metaphorical clock of Europe to before the French Revolution, where there were absolute monarchies, nobility were, were um, important, and overall their goal is to kind of make a rough balance of power. France should be roughly equal in power as Britain, as Prussia, as Austria. So again, Congress of Vienna, order and stability, Locks up Napoleon. You get the point. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you're still awake. I'll see you later.